Our topic this evening is liberal hypocrisy about censorship. Two weeks ago, Norman Lear's People for the American Way put out a 30-page press release on censorship. It looked like this. There wasn't any event that happened. It was just a press release that went out to all the news media, and instantly it was covered by all the networks, by all the wire services. Now this press release said that there was a 37% increase in the incidence of attempted censorship over the preceding year. This is a good example of what was shown in a little book published years ago called How to Lie with Statistics. I added up the number of incidents and it came to 96. Now figuring out with my own math, the 37% increase over the preceding year means that this tremendous rise in incidence of censorship represented an increase in the United States of America from 70 to 96. Now this is out of a nation of uh, 240 million people, uh, some 300,000 uh, public and school and college libraries, uh, 15,500 school districts, about 100,000 schools. And out of that great nation, they could dig up 96 examples of attempted censorship. Now this censorship even included somebody trying to censor a book called Show Me, which as many of you know is now illegal under the new child pornography law because it does show children performing sex acts. But they were accusing, that is people for the American way, uh, were accusing people of censorship in trying to get rid of a book that is now illegal and which the publisher has admitted is illegal. It is clear that this word censorship is now the trigger word that gives you instant access to the talk shows. Both ABC and CBS are now doing hour-long documentaries on this subject. That means a commitment of months of preparation and probably $300,000. So let's talk about censorship tonight. It's really an example of the old saying uh, that the thief would cry, stop thief, in order to uh, distract attention from his own thievery. Let's talk about censorship in schools and in academia, in libraries, in bookstores, and in the media. What they've done is to pick just a few isolated examples out of the millions of books and libraries and people that there are in this country. I passed by a bookstore in Georgetown last week and there was a big sign, a poster, that said that it was Banned Books Week. And it showed pictures of these books allegedly banned. Two of the pictures were of William Shakespeare and Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Now, the number of people who are trying to ban William Shakespeare and Alexander Solzhenitsyn must be as a fly speck on the whole horizon in comparison with the number of people in this country who are prohibited from reading Shakespeare and Solzhenitsyn because they cannot read. The real... The real shocking fact in this country is that we have 23 million functional illiterates. A new business committee called the Committee for Economic uh, Development issued a report a couple of weeks ago which has shown that more than half of the graduates of our public high schools in this country uh, really have a terrible problem of illiteracy. Specifically, what they said is that 25% of them are functional Ill functionally illiterate, which means they cannot read the help wanted sections of the newspapers, and another 33% are marginally illiterate, which comes to a total of more than half who are too illiterate to read Shakespeare and Solzhenitsyn. That is the real crime in our country today, and the reason why they are illiterate is because of the censorship of phonics out of the first grade readers.
Most of you can't remember how you learned how to read in the first grade. But to sum it up, phonics is the system of teaching the child the sounds and syllables of the English language so that the child can put them together like building blocks. There are 26 letters in the alphabet and 44 sounds. And when the child has learned those, he can build them like building blocks and read anything. And that is the proven best, really the only way of teaching children to be good readers of the English language. The other method, which is used in 85% of the public schools today, is called the whole word or look-say method. That means teaching children to memorize short lists of words by relating them to the picture on the page. And the child does not know the syllables that make up the words. So that the child who has learned to read by the whole word method might read pony for horse or vacation for holiday. The child who has learned to read by the whole word method can read an average of 350 words by the end of the first grade, 1,000 words by the end of the second grade, 1,250 by the end of the third grade, and only 1,550 by the end of the fourth grade. So no wonder the readers are boring, stupid, and repetitious, and the child loses all interest in learning. The child who has learned to read by the phonics method can read about 24,000 words by the end of the first grade and probably 40,000 words by the end of the fourth grade. Now that is the real disaster that has happened in public school uh, education today. But what is so interesting is the intolerance of the liberals and the educators who absolutely insist on censoring out the phonics in the first grade. I did a debate with one of the leading professors who were anti-phonics, professor of Indiana University, a year or so ago. And when we got to the end of the debate, we could ask each other questions. And I said to this professor, don't you think that in state textbook adoption, when they adopt seven series of readers from which the local schools can select, that one out of the seven could be a phonics series? And he answered in one word, no. They do not permit it in the name of academic freedom, uh, uh, educational diversity, local control, or anything else. They're not going to permit it. This is why a fourth of the recruits in the United States Navy today can't read well enough to read the instructions and the, uh, the uh, safety rules on the machinery. This is why business says that approximately 70% of the correspondence typed in, in our nation's businesses has to be retyped before it's sent out because they can't spell as well as read or write. It's not only necessary that people go to college know how to be good readers. You've got to be able to read the instructions in order to run machinery or to uh, follow the orders that you were given. In addition to the censorship of phonics out of the first grade, this le latest report by the Committee for Economic Development uh, talked about what they called the invisible curriculum. And I think that was a very good expression they told how the invisible curriculum uh, had censored out the skills that a young person needs to be able to hold a job, such as good work habits, being clean, on time, honest, reliable, accurate, and prompt, necessary qualities to hold and keep a job. But that isn't what they're learning. What they're learning in the invisible curriculum is that if you are late, tardy, or absentees, slovenly, and inaccurate, you're still going to get good grades. And that's what the invisible curriculum is teaching them today. Moving into another aspect of censorship, the most intolerant Gestapo-like censors in the country today, after the anti-phonics people, are the women's libbers who have gone to the book publishers of our country and gotten them to issue censorship guidelines telling their textbook writers what words may not be used if your textbook is going to be published. These uh, censorship guidelines prohibit the use of such words as chairman, you have to say chairperson, salesman, you have to say salesperson, you can't say founding fathers, you have to say precursors, you can't say brotherhood, you have to say humanity. Of course, you can't use the word lady because that might connote ladylike behavior. They even censor out uh, pictures that show little girls uh, as homemakers, and they induce role reversal by encouraging uh, use of a man wearing an apron every time they show a woman wearing an apron, and they specifically recommend that they show pictures of little girls playing with snakes and boys using hairspray. 
This is the cens these are the censorship Gestapo people who, who want to uh, create role reversals and confuse gender identity by the technique of censoring out certain words and phrases from the textbooks. You have the same thing in the career guidance materials, which have censored out all the notions that a young uh, girl might want to grow up to be a full-time homemaker. Uh, you don't see pictures of mothers with babies anymore. Uh, they give uh, little girls the impression that the only person who would pick the role of full-time homemaker uh, must be one who has no other skills. Then look at the censorship of the content of what is taught in the schools. Many of these press releases and many of the uh, media people who have phoned me on this subject seem to want to talk about some censorship of Romeo and Juliet. Now, uh, they have two uh, problems with this. One is the movie, uh, which does include a nude bedroom scene, to which some parents uh, rightfully object. And then others object to deleting 400 lines of the play, uh, Romeo and Juliet. But the real censorship is in not letting them know about the taming of the shrew. But you see, that would not be allowed in today's day and age, because that is a Shakespearean play that tells about the taming of a shrewish woman's liver by her husband. And that obviously would not be allowed in the schools today. So, so anytime anybody says anything to you about censoring 400 lines of Romeo and Juliet, you ask them why they censored the whole play called The Taming of the Shrew, one of Shakespeare's most delightful plays. Then they have rewritten a lot of the story. Some of you may have read uh, a child's book called The Little Steam Engine That Could. It tells a darling little story about a steam engine that with a lot of effort and a little help from another engine was able to chug, chug, chug up the mountain. Well, I just saw a current edition. It says it is retold. Let me tell you what retold means. It means they've changed this story so that all the good, kind, hardworking steam engines are female, and all the bad, arrogant, selfish steam engines are male. <laughs> yes, that's censorship. That's teaching a lesson. That is falsifying and changing the story in order to comport with the women's lib ideology that they are teaching in the invisible curriculum in the schools today. There's a lot of censorship that goes on in specific subjects. When I uh, analyzed a drug education course, I found uh, that uh, they had censored out all information about drugs being wrong, illegal, and destructive of mind and body. They just told them about a lot of drugs. You had uh, aspirin and laxatives and tobacco and alcohol and marijuana and cocaine and heroin. And you were told, well, there are some good reasons for taking them, some good recreational reasons. And then there are some bad reasons, maybe. And famous people take them. Now, you make up your own mind. I said this on a radio talk show, and a young man called in and said, yes, that's exactly the drug education program I had. First time I knew drugs were illegal was when my best friend got arrested. <laughs> censorship? Yes, it is censorship. They didn't tell him that marijuana and cocaine and heroin were wrong and illegal. Look at the whole treatment of uh, sex education in the schools. Again, it is a censorship area that is... Uh, very uh, obvious. They never tell them that premarital sex is wrong. I taped a segment for this ABC documentary coming up this week. Uh, uh, pitted against me was the superintendent of the Glenview School District in Illinois, and I asked him the question, do you know of a single public school that tells the children that premarital sex is wrong? He finally said no, he didn't know of a single one. Well, they censored that out. They censored out the child's right to grow up chaste and clean with a conscience that knows right from wrong. But further than that, they have uh, given the child, um, they have not told the child that there is a real double standard about sex. You know, they're so consumed with this thought of teaching them that everything's equal as between men and women. But it is a fact that there is a double standard. Women suffer more from VD. Women suffer more from the trauma of abortion. Women suffer more from the side effects of the contraceptives. Women suffer more from the poverty they have with children born out of wedlock. 
Women suffer more from the cancer that they get from early promiscuity. They don't tell them that. They tell them everything's the same as between men and women. And that is a real censorship operation in this whole area of what they teach about sex. During the three years in this country when the disease, the incurable VD called uh, herpes, rose in the number of people afflicted from 5 to 20 million, uh, it was real censorship, not only in the schools but in the media. They didn't tell you about it until that dramatic increase took place in this country from 5 to 20 million people who are afflicted with an incurable disease. I saw one of the, uh, the most widely circulated magazines used at the junior high school level during this period, and they had a two-page spread on herpes. And the title was, How to Avoid the Spread of Herpes. It gave a list of reasons, ways to avoid the spread. Uh, you can um, wash your hands frequently, uh, don't wear tight jeans, use cotton underwear, and don't use saliva to moisten your contact lenses. But it didn't tell them not to engage in sex. Is that censorship? Of course it's censorship. They're not telling them the facts that the teenagers needed to know. Then you look in the matter of prayer in the schools. Obviously censorship. They have invented this new system under which an atheist can censor everybody else from speaking the name of God. In spite of that, we see uh, complaints all over the country of schools which are telling the children about witchcraft, the occult. They are putting them through exercises of hypnotism, transcendental meditation, yoga, Eastern mysticism, guided imagery. And I've had several complaints from uh, mothers whose ch children were told by their teachers that there is a wise man inside of you, living inside of you, whom you can consult when you have a problem. In other words, they have censored out telling them they can consult with their parents or consult with God. You're supposed to consult with this wise man who is living inside of you. Look what they've done in history and how they have censored out the facts about the important part that religion played in the founding of our country. Do they tell them that Christopher Columbus came to this country for the purpose of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ? No, they don't tell them that. Do they tell them that the Pilgrim Fathers came to this country so that they could practice their religion? Yes, with the support of the government so that they could practice the religion that they wanted to practice. Do they tell you that almost every state in this country had a state constitution which started out with the name of God and expressed its reliance on divine providence? No, they don't tell you that. Do they tell you what a religious man George Washington was and how he believed that religion was an indispensable part of the state? Or do they tell you how strong he was in preaching against internationalism? No, they don't tell you that. Or do they tell you that the Declaration of Independence is our country's great religious document which mentions God five times? God is our creator. God is the supreme lawmaker. God is the source of all rights. God is the supreme judge. And God is our patron and protector. No, they don't tell us that. That's censored out. Also, they don't tell us the facts about the private enterprise system and how it is demonstrably the best system that has produced the most good things for the most people in the history of the world. All through history and in all the other countries, the rich and the rulers live well. In America, it's the poor who live well. The average person on welfare in our country lives better than most of the people who have ever lived on the face of the globe. They don't tell you about the tremendous provable success of the American private enterprise system. All they do is tell them about our problems. The textbooks don't tell children about the goodness of America and the most amazing event that ever happened in the history of the world after 1945 when the United States had not only uh, overwhelming military superiority that was more than every other country in the world, it was more than every other country combined. And holding that great power in our hands, we didn't use it to take over anybody else. You read your history books. Men have dreamed of conquering the world forever. Just imagine if that military power, the atomic bomb, had been in the hands of Stalin or Hitler or the Imperial Japanese, how different the face of the world would be. There is nothing so dramatic in all history as the United States holding that kind of power in our hands and not using it to take over anybody. Instead, taxing our people to send foreign aid to 100 countries around the world. 
Another area that is censored out of the education of our children is our heroes. They don't have any heroes anymore. They're not told about the great heroic men who built our country, Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln and how great they were. The invisible curriculum is terribly important in terms of what children are learning. It doesn't have to be a religious or a denominational curriculum. The great moral virtues can be taught in a non-religious or non-denominational way in the public schools that should not offend anybody except people who want to destroy the values of our children. Why aren't they teaching them such values as honesty is the best policy, virtue is its own reward, where there's a will, there's a way, the golden rule, waste not, want not, the consequences of idleness, crime doesn't pay, and respect for elders. That's what should be taught in the invisible curriculum. They have censored out hope and idealism and inspiration and trust in the future. Once you start to read the materials that are given in our schools, the most uh, consistent pattern is the depressing nature, the depressing materials that censor out hope and faith in the future. If you listen to the radio talk shows around the country, it is a very hot issue. It uh, gets the attention and stirs up the calls more than any issue going on at the present time. Uh, yet, it still hasn't been tackled uh, by the national media. Now, the people for the American way have tried to convert this issue into an issue of censorship. The real issue is the confrontation between those who believe that the parents are the primary educators of their children and those who believe that the government and their agents in the public schools have the right to teach our children whatever they want and it's none of the parents' business. Now those who are asking for enforcement of the Pupil Protection Amendment are not trying to censor anything. They are simply asking for the right to check no on the parental consent form. And all those parents who want their children to be invited to uh, throw people out of the lifeboat, to write assignments on when it is okay to lie or to cheat, to stand up and talk about premarital sex, uh, to discuss death education, can check yes on the parental consent form. But all we're asking for is the right to check no. Eagle Forum supports the parents as the primary educators. We support those who want to put their children in private schools, those who want to homeschool their children, but we also support the rights of parents who want to put their children in public schools because we're paying for them. And uh, the public schools have no right to interfere with the values, the religion, the culture, and the attitudes of the children who are put there by their parents. Let's look at a couple of other examples of censorship. One at the university level, a terrible embarrassment to Stanford University. They had a candidate for a PhD who committed the unforgivable. He published an article telling about the seven, eight, and nine month abortions in mainland communist China. And worse than that, he even published pictures. And so it was obvious that what he was telling was the truth. He had lived in China, he spoke the language, and he had the pictures to prove it. Would you believe uh, these liberals in academia fired him from their PhD program and would not give him a degree because he had embarrassed Red China? Look at the matter of the women's studies course. What a misnomer. They call them women's studies. They're not women's studies at all. They have censored out all the values about women and family that those of us here care about. The only thing they permit in those courses are the radical feminist lesbian studies, and they have called them women's studies while they have censored out traditional values. Look at the libraries. You go into any library and you'll find maybe 50 books expressing the feminist point of view. Try to find one or two representing the non-feminist traditional values anti-ERA point of view. Try to find them. Uh, the libraries that carry my books or the biography of me or anything that explains why the Equal Rights Amendment lost. You just have a very difficult time finding them. Uh, of course, those selections are made in a censorship operation 
mostly by the members of the American Library Association, which is another political lobby. I'll remind you that that is an organization that contributed dues money of its members to the political campaign to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment and participated in the boycott of the unratified states. So it's no surprise that, they, uh, that that ideology, that attitude, governs their selections in a type of preemptive censorship uh, when they buy the books for their libraries. And then if uh, uh, parents or taxpayers come in and uh, object to uh, some pornographic book they have there, they turn around and accuse the parents of censorship. Uh, I operate from the principle, which I think is a good uh, starting point for any of these discussions, that anybody who is spending the taxpayers' money has simply got to put up with having people, citizens, look over their shoulder and second-guess their judgment. And that applies to President Reagan, the congressman, the military, the teachers, and the librarians. Nobody's immune from that. You are perfectly within your rights in second-guessing the professional judgment of any librarian or any teacher. Take the bibliography that uh, we have put out with Eagle Forum, and uh, where you will see lists of many books which are uh, very frequently not included in libraries. And you will see how in various categories, such as feminism, uh, family, ERA, phonics, education, national defense, pornography, uh, you will find an overloading of books which express the liberal women's lib point of view and uh, a great scarcity of books which present the contrary point of view. You might think that one type of uh, book which would be safe from censorship would be dictionaries. Not so. The so-called Bible of dictionaries, the Oxford English Dictionary, was very embarrassed this year when it came out that while uh, many of us have accepted the English language Oxford Dictionary as the last word on definitions of words, uh, they put out a Russian, ed a Russian edition of the English Dictionary in which they changed the definitions of such words as capitalism, Marxism, and imperialism to agree with the Kremlin's definition of those words. That's what you call censorship. Look at uh, other dictionaries. Those of you who have dictionaries in your home which are more than 30 or 40 years old might be able to find a definition of humanism which says this, a contemporary cult or belief calling itself religious but substituting faith in man for faith in God. You won't find that definition in the modern dictionaries. That definition has been censored out. Let's look at censorship in the media. Now, you know the bias when you see it very obviously. Anybody can recognize it when the news commentator talks about the ultra-right-wing extremist Jesse Helms, but the moderate Ted Kennedy. That's pretty obvious. <laughs> or when they talk about the women's movement leader, Eleanor Smeal, but the anti-women's rights lobbyist, Phyllis Schlafly. That's pretty obvious. You can also see it when they show bleeding heart pictures about little children who are hungry because Ronald Reagan has cut off their food stamps, or old people who are freezing and dying in the cold because Ronald Reagan has cut off their fuel allowance. You can recognize that type of bias. But what is worse even than their bias is their censorship of the news that they don't give you at all. Of course, the best way to find out the news that has been censored is to read the Phyllis Schlafly Report of the last 18 years, because you will find all kinds <laughs> you will find all kinds of information on controversial subjects of public importance, which have been covered very little or not at all by the national news media. Just take a brief look at the 11-year battle we fought on the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, you all recognize the bias, very obviously, when they would put me up against three opponents. We got, kind of got used to that. That was obvious, and in, in the end, that kind of uh, turned against uh, those uh, stations and media which did that. But far more hurtful and diff to our campaign and more difficult to overcome was the censorship of the most important effect that ERA would have, namely that it would absolutely require the registration and drafting of young women and placing women in military combat. Now, 
that really was censored out of the debate. And every time I said it, the whole idea was ridiculed. And uh, they, were, uh, they would laugh at it. Uh, they would uh, convey the impression that that was just something I'd pulled out of the air, that it really wouldn't happen. And all the polls consistently showed that the majority of the American people did not believe that would be the result. Now, it's demonstrably uh, provable that that would be the result. There was never one lawyer in the country who denied that that would be the result. But that did not come through to the public. And the censorship of that fact uh, was the most difficult uh, problem that we had to overcome. Uh, in the last few weeks, uh, in the last couple of years, we have seen this censorship of the very existence of the full-time homemakers. Uh, they will say, half the women are in the labor force, but they don't tell you about the other half that is not in the paid labor force. But they do exist, as we have been pointing out tonight. And uh, we want to honor them and do recognize them. Uh, and uh, we want to uh, show people that they are there. They, um, they cannot really be censored out of uh, our uh, life, even though some people would like to try. Over the last couple of weeks, as I pointed out this afternoon, I bet I've heard 20 times on the national news media, the American people are not interested in tax reform. This has been said again and again on the nightly newscast. Well, to any extent that that's true, it's because the national nightly newscasts have given us 20, 25 minutes of events happening in countries five and 10,000 miles away, and they have not told the American people that if Ronald Reagan's tax reform goes through, every individual and every child in this country will have his exemption raised from $1,000 to $2,000 a year. Now, it's absolutely ridiculous to say that we're not interested in that. Of course we're interested but it's been censored out of the public perception of what tax reform is all about. Many of us, all of us, are enthusiastic supporters of SDI and High Frontier. Why is it so hard to sell that? Uh, we, we have proved that uh, the, those who say it won't work uh, are wrong. Uh, it's, it makes sense in every way, scientifically, militarily, uh, politically, uh, morally, every way you can name. The real reason it is such a problem for us to sell is because of the censorship of three items. Number one, the Soviet superiority in its missile force. The most American people do not know that and do not believe it. Secondly, they have censored out the fact that the United States today is absolutely defenseless against incoming missiles. The majority of the American people still do not know that if, if missiles came at us, there's nothing our government can do but tell you to say your prayers. There's absolutely no way they can shoot them down, but the American people do not know that. And the third thing they have censored out of this debate is the fact that SDI, High Frontier, can't kill anybody. It is not provocative. It is not offensive. It, it, it is not destabilizing. It's not any of those things. It can't kill anybody. All it can do is shoot down the enemy missiles when they're coming at us. In the pornography area, what the news media have censored out is the fact that you have no First Amendment right to disseminate obscenity any more than you have a right to speak libel, slander, blasphemy, or yell fire in a crowded theater. Yet the American people do not know that. They think you've got a First Amendment right to be obscene, but you don't. It's absolutely not part of the First Amendment. Look at the area of, of comparable worth. From that whole debate has been censored out the fact that we are comparing jobs that are not comparable and not equal, and it's only somebody's subjective opinion or allegation that they are comparable or equal, but they are not. And that, again, is an area of censorship. When we've dealt with the Genocide Convention, the, the whole text of the treaty and the danger that it poses to the Bill of Rights and to our rights under the Bill of Rights, has been censored out of the whole debate. All they do is yell genocide, 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 and they do not tell you the real danger that it poses. And then look at the matter of uh, the proposal to have a constitutional convention. Here we are at this point on, on the verge of a, what I think is a national catastrophe. Article 5 of the Constitution says that we must have a constitutional convention if 34 states call for it and 32 have. And yet there is ominous silence from the national media. 
You hear nothing about this impending uh, uh, terrible cataclysm into which our country uh, would be projected if we were to call for a constitutional convention that might put all of our great constitutional guarantees on the drawing board, on the table, to be wrangled about in a convention that nobody knows how would be elected or what they would have the capability of doing. The people who want to change our great constitution are waiting in the wings, and uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of powerful people in this country who want to get rid of our separation of powers, our great institutions of government, uh, which were given us by the founding fathers and which have preserved our freedom uh, during all these years. And yet, we hear practically nothing about it, nothing on the national media. I call that censorship. Thirteen years ago, a hundred of us met in St. Louis, and we selected an objective. Our defined objective at that point was to stop the Equal Rights Amendment from going into the Constitution. We identified our adversaries. They were the National Organization for Women, Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, and all their spokesmen. And we identified the intellectual and semantic battleground. The adversaries had served it up to us as women's rights. We accepted the challenge, and we set out to tell the country what women's rights really meant. We had a fantastic success with our movement. Now, there's some of those issues still around. Uh, we still have to take care of uh, the Equal Rights Amendment on the ballot in Vermont where uh, Eleanor Smeal says she's going to spend $250,000 in a last-ditch effort to try to have the first victory ERA uh, would have uh, since 1977. And we still have to deal with the feminist issue of comparable worth. But we can do that as part of our operation. We can do a great deal more besides. Today, we have a mighty movement of dedicated leaders like you in every one of the 50 states. Yes, we have an identified objective. It's the preservation of parental rights. Yes, we know who our adversaries are. The National Education Association is attacking Eagle Forum with regularity. However, they're chicken when it comes to debating us. They won't come out and uh, confront us. They are sending Norman Lear's People for the American Way out to do their uh, street fighting on these issues. But we know who they are. We know who the adversaries are. And they are extremely uh, uh, well-financed and capable. I have a lot of respect for their political ability. Uh, they have also served up the challenge in terms of the intellectual and semantic battleground. They have dished it up under this code word, censorship. Let's accept the challenge. The battleground again today is in Congress, it's in the state legislatures, it's in the media, and it's in the courts. And we can confront them on all those battlegrounds and tell them what censorship really means and how we are going to defend the values that we care about. Can we win? Of course we can win. We have the talent and the dedication and the perseverance and all those good qualities, then conquer we must, because our cause, it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. We have a mighty movement of people who understand this very complicated process of self-government in America. Most people, even a lot of those in it, don't understand how it operates. But you have been able to win tremendous battles at the state level, and articulate our position in the media, in the Congress, and in the courts. We know how to do it, and we are out to preserve the great values and the great heritage given to us by our founding fathers so that we will be able to pass this country along to our children as a free and independent nation.